Back in March, I put out a video called The Psychology of the Trinity. The focus of that video centered on two essays put out by the Swiss psychoanalyst Carl Jung and one of his students, Edward Edinger. Both papers analyzed two patterns in the history of religious symbolism. The first pattern is the tendency of world religions to associate the number three with the highest ranking gods, i.e. the Christian Trinity, the Hindu Trimurti and Tridevi, the Buddhist Trikaya, the Kabbalist Supernal Triad, the various Egyptian and Babylonian trinities, etc. The second pattern is the tendency for these trinities to exclude a fourth element in order to maintain a state of perfection at the expense of being whole. For example, the masculine Christian trinity excludes the feminine element. There are reasons given for this, alongside a multitude of other examples, but I will save those for later in the video. Let's turn our attention to why these essays might be relevant to The Legend of Zelda. I only started getting into Zelda and its lore about two months ago, when I did a video analyzing Majora's Mask. Around that time, I became aware of a long, debated fan theory regarding the franchise's iconic symbol, the Triforce. For those who know nothing about Zelda lore, the Triforce represents the three creator goddesses of Hyrule, as well as the virtues they infused into the world during its creation. But it isn't just a symbol, it is a relic of divine power that can grant any wish to whomsoever wields it. Now some fans have speculated that the Triforce wasn't originally three pieces, but four. A Tetraforce, if you will. As for what evidence exists of a Tetraforce, there is admittedly not a lot. There are only two pieces of evidence I could find. One was on Link's shield from Ocarina of Time. Notice the inverted golden triangle at the bottom of the shield that could easily fit inside the middle of the Triforce. The other piece of evidence is the inverted triangle on the Shadow Medallion, also from Ocarina of Time. Notice the three circles surrounding it, possibly signifying the three goddesses against a fourth unknown deity. Though there is some support for the theory, it does face considerable opposition. Most notably is the removal of that triangle from Link's shield in all subsequent games, which some reasonably believe was done by the developers to remove confusion. There is also the fact that there has been no official confirmation or hinting of the existence of a fourth piece by the developers. Nonetheless, that hasn't stopped fans from speculating about a fourth piece's existence, and I think I can understand why. When I learned about the Tetraforce theory, I was immediately reminded of Jung and Edinger's essays on trinities and their tendency to exclude a fourth element. I dismissed those similarities at first, mainly because I didn't and continue to not believe that the Zelda franchise was in any way influenced by Jungian theory or psychoanalytic theory broadly speaking. Yet, over the last few months, my lack of belief has continuously been challenged by the increasing number of similarities between things said in those essays and established Zelda lore. I have been unable to reconcile these two opposing feelings on my own. So today, I will be presenting all the similarities I have come across along with the reasons to believe and disbelieve their suggestion of the Tetra Force's existence. That way, all of you can help me, an admitted newcomer, determine if there is or isn't anything there. To start, let's review the two patterns that Jung and Edinger observed. First, why is the number three associated with the world's greatest divinities? Jung begins his speculation by citing the work of the ancient Greek philosopher and mathematician Pythagoras. In his speculation on the meaning of numbers, Pythagoras believed that the number one represented the idea of perfect unity, hence the idea of oneness. It is the number from which all other numbers arise, and in which the opposite qualities of numbers, the odd and the even, must therefore be united. In this way, Pythagoras viewed the number one in the same way many religions of the world viewed their highest deity, 
as a sort of union of opposites. When everything is in a state of oneness, there is nothing outside of it. No odd or even, light or dark, good or bad. It's all in a state of oneness, of unity. This is why Pythagoras viewed the number 2 to be the real first number, because with it, separation and multiplication begin, which alone makes counting possible. Now the number 2 presents a problem. If 2 exists, the state of oneness breaks. But if the number 2 ceases to exist, its individuality ceases to exist as well. To Pythagoras, this tension is resolved by a third uniting force. This means that the idea of oneness, the most holy goal of perfect unity, is described by the number 3. Two opposing elements united by a third force. Two examples of this that I cited in my video on trinities were the Tao of yin and yang. Both yin and yang, chaos and order, one and two, are united in the Tao by the third uniting force, qi. The other example is the Kabbalist supernal triad, where knowledge, okma, and wisdom, bina, unfold from the perfect unity of Kether. Yes, I know I'm not pronouncing these right. In short, Jung and Enninger believed that human beings were psychologically motivated to ascribe the number three to their highest deities because it inherently describes the idea of oneness, of unity. That was the first pattern. The second pattern is the tendency for these trinities to exclude a fourth element to maintain their state of perfection. To best explain why Jung and Edinger thought this happens, let's first return to the ancient Greeks. One famous Greek philosopher who was heavily influenced by Pythagoras was Plato. In his book Timaeus, Plato describes his difficulty reconciling the Pythagorean idea of unity with his theory of forms. In short, Plato theorized that there was a dimension of ideas, and alongside that, a material dimension where an idea took on multiple forms. So if the idea of a chair existed in the idea realm, the idea would take on many forms in the material world. As for the idea of unity, Plato had trouble reproducing this in material reality because the idea is inherently two-dimensional. It's a plane. It is two points united by a mean. Trying to give three-dimensional form to the two-dimensional idea of unity would require it to have height, width, and depth, which would require more than one mean. However, the additional mean corrupts the original idea of unity, because now there are four points instead of three. Simply put, the properties of the three-dimensional material universe corrupt the two-dimensional idea of three. It is an irreconcilable fourth. Jung and Edinger went on to show how Plato's problem shows up in respect to numerous religious symbols. Let's start with the Kabbalists. In their creation myth, Einsoth, or God as Infinity, manifested his light in the void of space within ten vessels. Seven of those vessels broke, because they could not contain the light. The shards of those vessels and the light they contained went on to form the known universe, while the supernal triad remained intact. Between the triad and the other seven vessels rests an invisible vessel known as dot, which translates to void. It is the thing which separates the material realm from the heavenly realm, which is not unlike Plato's realm of ideas. Like with Plato, the material void is, once again, the fourth element that the triad cannot reconcile with. The irreconcilable fourth takes on other forms, though. With Christianity, as I said before, the fourth element can take the form of the feminine, which is very symbolically appropriate. The dark material void in esoteric thinking is viewed as the cosmic womb. In Taoism, it is the feminine yin, the chaos from which all life is birthed. Jung believed that the Catholics intuited that that feminine element needed to be reconciled with the Trinity, which is why they proclaimed the Assumptio Mariae in the 1950s. 
a doctrine that proclaims the belief that the body of Mary was taken up into heaven to sit alongside the Trinity, Mary being the mother of Jesus, obviously. Outside of that possibility, Jung pointed out the Gnostic belief that the Trinity was originally a quaternity, one made up of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Satan, until Satan was cast out of heaven, which follows a tendency to assign an evil character to this fourth element, because it cannot reconcile with the heavenly trinity. In these and other examples that Jung and Edinger cite, the fourth element is an opposite that the trinity needs to reconcile with in order to achieve a true state of oneness. Not the idea of oneness, but its manifestation in reality. That fourth element often takes the form of chaos that is opposed to order, the material void that is opposed to the immaterial heavens, one gender opposed to the other, and evil against good. Until one opposite reconciles with the other, the perfect order can never be whole. I'm sorry we had to spend the last five or six minutes on all of that, but it was necessary in order to explain how these patterns are relevant to Zelda. Let's just put aside for the next few minutes whether these patterns were intentionally included and just look at the similarities. Item number one. As we learn in the creation myth presented in Ocarina of Time, the three goddesses Din, Nehru, and Feror descended from the sacred realm to make the universe and Hyrule out of chaos. The three goddesses represent order acting upon the fourth element, chaos, which is the name often given to describe the void of space. Item number two. The space between the Triforce is the formless chaos that the three goddesses make order out of. It is the fourth, formless, and inverted triangle, in opposition to the three tangible, upright triangles. Item number three. We learn in Skyward Sword that Demise, a god of chaos, appeared out of a fissure in the earth after the world was created. He is the fourth element that cannot reconcile with the three goddesses. Item number four. Partially breaking from traditional symbolism, demise as chaos is the male slash masculine, which is in opposition to the three female slash feminine goddesses as order. Item number five. Din, Nehru, and Feror represent three of the four classical elements, fire, water, and wind. But where is the fourth? Where is Earth? Well, Demise appeared out of the Earth, the most material of the four classical elements. Item number six. The aforementioned Shadow Medallion is appropriately named, with its downward-facing triangle representing the dark chaos and evil that cannot reconcile with the three goddesses of order and light. Item number seven. The shadow medallion is appropriately colored purple, a color that is also associated with the element of Earth, as seen in the Minish Cap. In that game, you need to obtain the four elements so you can infuse their power into the Four Sword. The element of Earth, like shadow, is colored purple. Finally, item number eight. Regardless of conscious intention, Link's shield in Ocarina of Time represents the problem of the irreconcilable fourth quite well. The Triforce sits above in the sacred realm, while the fourth piece sits far below in the material world below. What all of this suggests to me is if the Tetraforce theory were legitimate, big emphasis on the word if, this might be one of the ways it could be true. By applying Jung and Edinger's theory of trinities and quaternities, the inevitable conclusion is that the space between the Triforce is the fourth piece of the hypothesized Tetraforce, representing the chaotic, material, evil, and gendered opposite to the ordered, heavenly, and moral goddesses. Now let me readdress the one major problem with this perspective. 
Like I stated from the beginning, I don't think there is any evidence that suggests that the creators of Zelda were inspired by psychoanalytic theory regarding the creation of symbols, meaning there's no chance that these patterns were consciously included. This is why I have refrained from doing this video for such a long time, but nonetheless, the resemblance between Zelda's mythos and Jung and Edinger's theories are uncanny. In order to try and resolve these opposing sentiments within me, I reached out to a friend and fellow YouTuber named Gaming University, a guy who knows Zelda mythology inside out and backwards. I presented my findings to him to get his thoughts, and he told me that I wasn't the first person to suggest that the space within the Triforce was the fabled fourth piece. He then linked me to a video titled, Did I Just Solve Three of Zelda's Biggest Mysteries? by a YouTuber named Gossipgeist. Not only did he also theorize that the space was the fourth piece all along, but he also offered up additional arguments in favor of that interpretation, based in not only Zelda lore, but also Japanese superstition. Starting with the latter, the word for the number four in Japanese is Shi which just so happens to be the same word used to describe the concept of death in the Japanese language. This is why, for example, the number is removed from the floors of buildings and hotel rooms, just like some buildings in the West remove floors and rooms with the number 13. Geist then theorized that maybe this superstition influenced Zelda lore, as for his other arguments, Geist draws upon an entity which shows up in the form of a statue in both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. This entity is known as the Horned God. According to dialogue from the Horned God and an NPC named Jaren, the Horned God is the opposite of the Goddess of Light, Hylia, the representative of the three goddesses and protector of the Triforce. Jaren says that her existence and her powers can only be permitted if there is an opposite to define her. In other words, light cannot exist without darkness. Chaos cannot exist without order. The female Hylia cannot exist without the male horned god. Geist then goes on to apply this law to the goddess Trinity. If Hylia cannot exist without her opposite, does the same not apply to the three goddesses? If Hylia's power cannot exist without her opposite, then how can the Trinity's ordering powers exist without chaos to act upon? Geist then concludes that, maybe, this logic confirms the existence of an unknown god or goddess of chaos. Maybe that space in the middle represents Demise slash Ganondorf or the Horned God. Or as Geist suggests, maybe those two are emissaries for a greater evil. It would also explain why Demise slash Ganondorf constantly feels the need to usurp the power of the Triforce and sow chaos which, as Geist points out, has never had an explanation. The three goddesses tampered with the pre-existing world of chaos. Naturally, the forces of chaos would want to fight back against this encroachment. So, do my findings and Gossip Geist's findings prove the Tetraforce theory? Not necessarily. Again, there's still the issue of conscious intent on the part of the developers, which I don't believe is there. But that said, I don't think it's unreasonable to speculate that these similarities were produced unconsciously. After all, the basis of Jung and Edinger's essay was that these cross-cultural patterns of trinities and irreconcilable opposites are produced unconsciously. They are archetypes, woven into the fabric of existence. And by the way, if this idea of unconscious patterns and archetypes seems too far-fetched, I highly recommend checking out this video which talks about an artistic pattern called Penrose Tiling, one that cultures across the world have used to illustrate divinity. I will link it in the description box below. As it stands, I have no definitive position on the matter of the Tetraforce. I think it's reasonable to suggest that there is something there, just as much as it is reasonable to suggest that there isn't. Hopefully by presenting all of this information, a far more knowledgeable Zelda fan will guide me to one conclusion or the other. 
If you like this video, please give it a like. It's quick, free, and helps out my channel a lot. Special thanks to Gaming University. Please go check out his channel, especially if you're a fan of the game developer Remedy famous for games like Max Payne, Alan Wake, and Control. His content on those games is, without exaggeration, the best on the internet. Special thanks to Indy, another massive Zelda fan who also gave me feedback on my theories and helped me edit this video. Finally, if you enjoy this type of in-depth analysis and want to help ensure its continued production, please consider supporting me on Patreon or joining my YouTube members section. I will leave links to both in the description box below. Thanks for watching, and until next time, stay yellow.